I'm Lisa Falk. I'm head of community engagement for the museum and I'll serve as your host this evening. As many of you know, and some of you may not coming from so far away, Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona. We're located in Tucson. We are situated on land that's been stewarded by indigenous peoples for 13,000 years. And today, the Tucson area is home to the Tanatum Nation and the Pasco Yaqui tribe. Currently, there are 22 federally recognized tribes within the reserva with, it, with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. The museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous peoples of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. And we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. After being closed for over a year, ASM recently reopened with a new exhibit called Wrapped in Color, Legacies of the Mexican Serape. This Zoom talk series expounds upon the stories in the exhibit. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome tonight's speakers, Master Weavers Irvin and Lisa Trujillo. Irvin Trujillo is a seventh generation Rio Grande weaver taught by his father. And Lisa learned to weave when she married into the family in 1982. They both create finely woven traditional Rio Grande weavings and highly skilled and imaginative contemporary tapestry pieces. Both Irvin and Lisa have won many awards for their work. And in 2007, Irvin Trio was honored for his mastery and continuity of tradition by being named a National Heritage Fellow by the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the highest honor a folk artist in this country can receive. The Trujillos are owners of Sentinel, Sentinella Traditional Arts, a tapestry gallery in Chimayo, New Mexico, that represents the talents of local Chimayo weavers. And tonight, Lisa and Irvin will share a brief history of Rio Grande weaving, as well as show some of their own extraordinary work. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Irvin. Uh, Lisa is going to cover some of the things, and I will cover uh, some of the items that we're going to talk about. Um, we are talking about the Rio Grande weaving tradition which has been in northern New Mexico along the Rio Grande Valley since the 1600s. And um, I'm just going to start by giving you a, a context in terms of weaving. Uh, the earliest weaving for Pueblos is probably about 10,000 years ago. And the Pueblo Indians were cultivating cotton. And mostly, um, they were also using yucca, yucca fiber to make textiles, uh, burial shrouds and uh, things like that. Anyway, the, the Pueblo Indians, if you look on the right, uh, they use the upright loom and it's quite different than the Spanish loom, but what I'm gonna talk about is this, what happens after the Spanish get here. Uh, the Spanish introduced the sheep in I think 1540 when Coronado came to New Mexico. I, I can't, I didn't get a chance to look at that. Anyway, um, the breed that they brought was the churro. The churro was the peasant breed in Spain and it was actually called churra in Spain. But in here in New Mexico, they started uh, calling them the churro. And um, you can see on the right in the picture of the sheep, how long the, the fleece is. And the, originally the sheep were brought for meat and they were, gonna, they were gonna be used to feed the colonists that came. Um, and they ended up being a commodity that would provide wool that would be used to make the utility blankets and carpeting. Um, the earliest documentation of any weaving in New Mexico is 1638 and Governor Luis de Rosas supposedly listed six looms in his will. So uh, they say that he had an obraje in Santa Fe and that was the earliest use of the upright or the floor loom, standing floor loom that the Spanish brought. The wool trade developed later on, but I'm sure that, that there was fleece it was traded to the natives, um, the Pueblo Indians to be used on the upright loom. The blanket trade basically develops as the trade, uh, effectos del, del país from here in New Mexico, they start to be taken back to Mexico City. And the, I think the use of the sheep not only was for wool, but to produce textiles. The churro sheep, if you look on the on the slide over here, you have the four-horned ram. It, it actually, the, the ram 
the, the sheep can have up to six, uh, three pairs of, of horns. And you can see by the, by the sheep here that they have different varieties. The other characteristic of the uh, churro sheep is the long staple or the length of the fiber, which was really suitable for spinning. It's a double fleece. It's a double fleece. And what does that mean, Lisa? It means it has a long, hairy outer coat and an undercoat that's very fine. So it's kind of two different kinds of wool in the fleece. And you can separate that out. Uh, the, um, the other thing that the Spanish brought was the design of the loom from Spain. And most of the looms, instead of having a vertical warp like the Pueblo Indians used in their weaving, the, hor the, the Spanish loom is a horizontal loom and it's what's called a counterbalance loom. It has two harnesses or two sets of warps and the weaver stands at the loom. The harnesses, which is kind of technical, it either, the, the weavings were either, either made on a two harness or a four harness loom. These are examples of old looms that uh, one of them is a restoration and the other one was a replicate, replica of an old loom. And you can see the looms on the left, they were very bulky in terms of what they were using as lumber. They're, they're posts on the, on the loom on the left. The one in the middle has square posts. In other words, they were hand hewn with an adze. And then the one on the right was my father's loom. And you can see it's uh, made out of milled lumber. Some of the things that have changed since the looms were introduced is the change to milled lumber and also the string heddles. The heddles are this, this picture right here with all the strings going up and down. This is where the warp is passed through uh, to open the sheds. And the shed, you can see on the second row of pictures, right under the word reeds, you can see the warp kind of opening right there. And that opening is made with the harnesses. The, um, the reed, which you see on the left side, it was made out of wood and they cut the wood into slats. Sometimes they would use bamboo, uh, but most of the uh, reed dents were formed with uh, wood slats. And this is kind of a, um, I can't think of it. I'm not going to go there. Okay, so um, one of the other things that changed is are the wooden gears, the pulleys, and the harnesses. Uh, a lot of weavers use metal harnesses now. Some weavers use, still use wood harnesses, but and the gears and pulleys vary between looms. And you can remember over here, th these looms are a box structure. It looks like a box. And in the new loom, if you look on the right side of this slide, you'll see the castle coming up in the middle of the loom and the posts in the corners are no longer forming a box, but it, it, it supports a horizontal warp and that's how the weaving is made. The spinning was done with a malacate. Malacate is a, similar to a Navajo spindle, but it's a lot shorter. And in my family, they used to use a malacate, like Lisa is spinning on the, on the right side. My grandmother was spinning on the left side. She uses a bowl for the base to put the malacate in so it doesn't uh, travel around. And Lisa's using a bowl uh, with a malacate in the bowl. And then she's, draw she's spinning with her left hand. Or in this case, she's spinning with the right hand and drawing the wool with her left hand to make the, the thread. One of the other things that changes through the evolution is the dyes. In early days, they only used natural dyes or undyed yarn. The utility pieces mostly used undyed yarns. And when the Spanish started to bring the, the uh, indigo up, they start to use indigos and in some wood, wood dyes, the Brazil wood and sapan, logwood, things like that. And they say that the Logwood was put on the on the wagons to, as a ballast to support the, the load, to balance the load. And that's what I've read. I don't know if that's true or not. The um, factory dyed yarns came after the Americans took over New Mexico and the products from back east, from the east 
part of the United States started to show up in Santa Fe and they, uh, they arrive as a factory spun and dyed yarn. The, the dyes originally uh, were natural dyes on a commercially spun wool. And then after the aniline dyes were invented or aniline dyes in 1856, they start to come into New Mexico and change the color palette of the weaving. Uh, the Spanish introduced the, it, they didn't introduce, the natives were already using the indigo for dyeing when the Spanish arrived in Central America. And what the Spanish started to do was they started plantations in uh, San Salvador, which is now El Salvador, and they were raising indigo to ship back to Europe. For those of you who don't know the process of processing indigo, the plant, if you look on the upper left hand corner, the plant is, is an indigo plant. And what they used to do is they put it in big tubs or uh, tanks and they would cover the, the plant with water. And then they would introduce the, they would introduce lime into the water and that would um, make the solution alkaline. And when oxygen was introduced, like on the, on this uh, slide where they're stirring the, or agitating the, the indigo solution with rods, uh, what that does is introduces oxygen into the solution and it reduces the indigo and the plant will secrete these small particles of indigotin and that's what cells or floats on the bottom of, on the top of the tank. And when they pull the, the, the water, the, the, the solid, uh, particles of indigotin, uh, they drop to the bottom. And what happens is they, the, the mud comes out and that is what was exported or imported into New Mexico. And you can see the mud in these small um, wooden trays right here. And on the left side, on the right side, you see a cake form of indigo ball form. Um, it comes in all forms now. Uh, I know an African dyer in, in Santa Fe who's actually getting dried indigo from Africa when he's using it. Um, most of the indigo that I've used for dyeing has been from importers, I've obtained it from importers who uh, have brought it. I've used Mexican indigo, I've used Indian indigo, I've used Indonesian indigo. And there's a lady now in um, Tennessee who's um, trying to get the tobacco growers to raise indigo as a crop. And she is processing the indigo I've used that indigo, it's really good quality and I recommend it to anybody that, at Stony Creek anyway, that's the company. Down here on the, on the lower left, you can see the cochineal insect, which is found on the Opuncha cactus. It is a parasite of the cactus. And so in Oaxaca and Peru, they have plantations that are growing the cactus as a crop. And then they introduce the insect and the insect will lay the eggs on the plant. You can see these little white specks next to the red finger. And that's basically the, lar the uh, eggs that are, that are laid and eventually they form uh, larvae. And what they do is they scrape off the, the, the web or, or the, the, the larvae, I guess, uh, which the, you call the, it, the plant. Yeah, the, the, beetles. Plant. the beetles, yeah. And, and then they'll dry it and that's how it's sold. Uh, they the cochineal that I'm using now is from Peru. Uh, it's been hard to get it from Mexico, mainly due to uh, use by the cosmetic industry and also the food industry, and also the, the use there in Oaxaca, of course, and I guess uh, Mr. Gutierrez will talk about that. And here in New Mexico, if you look on the lower right hand, you see the chamiso, and the chamiso blooms in the fall, and that's when I dye my wool, is in the fall, and I'll dye plants, roots, um, and the indigo and the cochineal. And these are some of the things I use now. Matter root, which comes from India. We have some matter root growing in our garden, but it takes about three years to form a root structure in order to, to use it. The kota, which is on the upper right-hand corner, that's a plant that blooms right after July 4th, and it's used as an Indian tea. In Spanish, it's called kota, and that makes a lot of colors, uh, kind of an orangish, uh, pumpkin color. Down on the left side, you have Palo, Palo de Campeche, which is uh, logwood. 
sometimes they would call it sapan, which is uh, Brazil wood. And that those are woods that were brought from Central America or Mexico into New Mexico. Uh, right now I'm using commercial powders as well. So I use wash fast acid dyes on some of the work that I do right when I match uh, colors for clients that you know want certain shades. Uh, the dyeing process in, here in the fall in my shop, it looks like this. We have lots of dried yarn. You can see in the upper right, upper left hand corner, I'm, and my pots that, that I use are in a, a small shed and I use propane burners to apply heat to the dye vat. The upper right, my daughter is rinsing the yarn in the irrigation ditch. The acequias were established in 1775 here in Northern New Mexico and uh, the water rights are like gold here. So having enough water to rinse the yarn uh, is very valuable. Um, and something that I was we we're lucky to have right here at this at the shop. The one of the other things that changes in the in the industry is the wool, and of course the most of the wools prior to uh, 1848 around there were um, were hand spun, and most of the warp that was used in Rio Grande weaving is a two ply, which means that there's two strands. Of, of thread that are twisted together to make a stronger thread. And in Spanish textiles, the, most of the, in fact, all the, uh, the warp that I've seen is a double stranded or two ply warp. The weft thread in Spanish weaving mostly has been uh, one thread in, in the old Rio Grande pieces, but has changed now to a commercial source. Uh, of course, there's always people using the singles and the, and the, the, the two-ply warp still today. But what happened in the uh, 1840s when the United States, when the Americans started to come, they started to bring wool from back east that was already spun in mills. And what was happening is that the wool was leaving New Mexico back east, and then it was coming back as yarn. Uh, there's Saxony yarn that I think was just called Saxon yarn based on the, um, the, the company that was making it. There's also Zephyr yarn. Uh, and these occur in 1840, I have 1848 to 1865. These dates are plus or minus, you know. <laughs> and then the Germantown wool starts to show up in 1868. And one of, one of the styles um, that developed in Spanish weaving was from the Germantown wool. The change that happened in the late 1800s when the tourist industry starts here in, Chima, in, uh, in Santa Fe is the introduction of applied wool. The Germantown wool was a three ply, started out as a three ply and then later on uh, it became a four ply. And sometimes it's easier to, to see old Germantown pieces based on the plies of the weft yarn. The Klasgans company which is a company that all the dealers here in Chimayo use today, um, has been shipping yarn to Chimayo since about 1898. One of the things that changed was switching from a cotton wool, cotton warp to a wool warp. The wool warp in Chimayo starts around uh, 1922, and it was introduced by my uncle, uh, Severo Jaramillo. And that's pretty much all, all there is. So up, uh, Oh, the other thing I, I up on top where the strings are, there's a black and white two ply warp. And that's in Spanish, Spanish weaving or Rio Grande weaving, it's called a coyote warp. And that means that it's uh, half coyote is uh, part white and part black and part Spanish actually, part Spanish and part white. Anyway, um, it's a blend. It's a blend, yeah. And this is a very common warp in Rio Grande weavings. So in order to identify old pieces, if you open up the, the weft and look at the warp, you can see if it's a two-ply or one-ply. Most Navajos use a one-ply warp and Spanish weaving uses two-ply. Even today, we still use a two-ply warp. These are the Spanish designs that were developed, uh, not so much designs, but textiles and their uses, which evolved from the early Spanish days to today. And if you look on the left, there's jerga, and herga was used for carpeting. The next to it is the sabanilla or colcha, and that was used um, 
for sheeting, uh, for mattresses. They make mattresses, which is called a colchon. And then the colcha was, is the bedspread. And they used to embroider the, the ground fabric of Savania with uh, thread to make designs to put over the bed as a bedspread. The, the one in the middle, the old Rio Grande basically are striped pieces. They are mostly done with a shuttle, no tapestry in the Spanish period until the early 1800s. And one of the influences of the Saltillo Sarape is the, the tapestry technique, which starts to show up in New Mexico around 1800. Uh, the earliest pieces I've seen are actually early 1800. Uh, the Bazan brothers were two brothers, Ignacio and Juan Bazan, that came into New Mexico. In 1807, they were commissioned by the governor to improve the industry in uh, Santa Fe and northern New Mexico. And what happened is the tapestry technique starts to show up within the stripes and then later on as complete tapestries. Uh, these were blanket sized pieces, so they were large pieces, not uh, curio items that were that later developed in the Chimayo industry. Most of the old pieces in blankets were, you know, about 48 inches to 50 inches wide by anywhere from seven to nine feet uh, long. And that's a pretty long piece, but I've seen them that long. The, the Vallero is the next period, and that occurs when the American yarns start to show up, and later on the aniline dyes, which were bought by the Americans, uh, they changed the color palette from blue, black, and white to red, pink, purple, real orange. bright green, orange, things like that. Yeah, screaming, screaming colors. And the last style that we're going to talk about is the Chimayo. The Chimayos developed from the tourist industry after the railroad comes in in 1880, and they um, were developed as a different function than the blanket in terms of what the sizes were suited for. And the blanket size pieces start to show up as a 20 by 20 inch uh, kind of what they call a conguita or, a, or 10 by 10 or you know 10 by 20 inches or 30 by 60 or 36 by 60, 48 by 72. They standardize the sizes in the industry, and the sizes are still being woven today. So if you look at herga, the old hergas are black and white, like the piece on the left. Uh, there's no dyes in the pieces. You can see the pieces are woven in two narrow strips and then sewn together to make a larger piece. The uh, herga was used um, for carpeting mostly, and then as sackcloth, like a tarp. And they were uh, wrapped goods to be taken on the Camino Real or the Spanish Trail uh, back to, um, not really, not the Spanish Trail, mostly back to Mexico, Mexico City. Camino Real. Camino Real, yeah. And so you can uh, look on the pictures here, the straight trail, it looks like a herringbone, just like your jeans. It's a, it's a four harness weave. The diamond twill is what's called the Ojo de Perdiz, which is a partridge eye and these weaves are made with a four harness loom, which is not a two harness loom, which means that's obvious. But um, unless you're a weaver, it's hard to explain what harnesses are, other than there's four sets of it's a frame of, that holds the warp threads. Yeah, the the, um, the warp threads are formed into four layers, and each layer can inter interact with each other to make different uh, designs. Anyway. And most of the herga, both the warp and the weft, is made out of singles. So they are one ply, not two ply, like I just mentioned in the blankets. But the herga uses a lot of one ply. Uh, let me see. OK, well, I'll just get to the bottom. The bottom thing is um, the herga evolves to rags. So eventually, when cotton goods and other uh, fabrics start to come into the area, they're starting to tear them up into half inch strips and then uh, weave them into what's called a piso. In my family, they used uh, sheets and also just uh, colored rags and they were alternating rows. So I have a certain uh, way to tell if it's from my family or not, <laughs> I hope. Anyway, so the next fabric I was talking about was the Savania. If you look at the weave here, this is called a balanced plain weave. And that means that the warp and the weft are uh, singles. And 
the this picture has plied yarn, but um, if you can imagine this with a single um, thread. It's balanced, it means you can see both the left and the left equally. There you go. So she's good. <laughs> okay. Um, the Sabanista, Sabania uses, in the old days, they used to make uh, mattresses out of it, and they it was produced as a yardage good, so you'd buy so many varas of, of um, Savania, and then you'd make a mattress, and you'd stuff the mattress full of wool fleece, and of course you could unsew it and take the fleece out to wash it, and the fabric as well. Uh, it's also used as a ground fabric for embroidery, for a colcha embroidery, and the colcha embroidery, Lisa's going to just explain it real quick. Oh, <laughs> I think the image does a really good job. So the it's a self couched embroidery stitch. So if you're going to do it, you're going to you're going to do a pointer here. You'll do a really one really long stitch that you'll uh, sew first, and then you'll come back and you'll you'll just sew it down. And and there isn't very much that's going to show on the back side. So you can see that there's just a small amount that's on the back of the fabric. But uh, but you've got a solid coverage, like you can see on the on this bottom image. So it covers the front of the fabric with a whole nother layer of wool, and the back of the fabric with just really small stitches. So it's um it it, it it's for covering a lot of uh, ground, and they're they're just the flow of of the stitches is where the sort of artistic interest is, I think. Um, but unlike the designs that we use, there's a lot of room for curves and stuff. So, so materials for culture have changed. Sometimes people use cotton, mostly wool ground. And you can see in the lower right hand, the, the chintz fabric influenced the early Spanish. And to find a, a culture that is a bed spread size, they are very rare and very valuable. Uh, I have not seen that many actual uh, wool on wool cultures that are completely covered with a weft with a with a culture stitch. That okay. one's got some chain stitch in it. Doesn't matter. Go ahead. Okay. The other <laughs> fabric I'm going to be talking about is the Rio Grande frazada. The frazada is the word for blanket in Spanish, and the pieces, early pieces, or the pieces that were utility started out plain wool. They didn't have much design at all. They were mostly woven with a shuttle as opposed to tapestry or broken weft weave, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then um, the later pieces start to have five or seven bands in the uh, structure of the piece or the design of the piece. And there's two ways to make a blanket size piece that were used in, um, old, old, uh, the first uh, blankets anyway. And these are the two methods of construction. The double weave, if you look at the lower left hand corner, you can see that there's two layers of warp and the weft thread uh, goes back and forth on the top layer and then it goes down to the bottom layer and it goes back and forth on the bottom layer, it comes back over here and then it goes back to the top layer. So it goes back and forth uh, on the top layer and then back and forth on the bottom layer. But it's hooked up or it joins the same end thread or the selvage. And if you look at the top left, there's just a line that looks like it's sewn together. But if you look really closely, it's a double warp usually uh, here in the in the center. Uh, the picture on the right it's, shows it's a, you're weaving a folded piece when you do a double. Yeah, oh yeah, that, that. yeah. So um, when you, when you uh, take the piece off the loom, so it's it's woven in two in one width on the loom. But it's in two layers on the loom. So when you unfold, take it off the loom and you unfold the layers, it makes a blanket size piece. And that's called a double weave or a double woven piece. It's one piece. This the center seam is also very common uh, in Spanish weaving. And I don't I speculate sometimes about the construction of the loom, whether the constraint of the reed will dictate how wide you can make the fabric because it'll stress the the, uh, the the reed on the loom. It's one of the parts. But you can see here, there's two pieces sewn together back and forth with the thread. And that's how they were joined. 
Um, the Fresada Campo is one of the types of field blankets and mostly in dark wool. So it's, we see a lot of black uh, wool, uh, sometimes without very much uh, banding at all, just simple stripes of any, no dyes. And they were used out in the field uh, as a blanket. You can see on this piece that wear up here at the top where the head is, um, who knows? Anyway, then uh, we call what's what we call a Taos trade blanket is a blanket that has is made with gray wool. So mostly uh, the Taos trade blankets have a little bit of indigo, not that much, but any piece with an indigo with some ind dyed indigo in it would obviously sell for more than a plain piece of fabric. Just uh, you know the the just the, yeah just undyed the wool. undyed wool. Okay. And then there's the frasada de boda. The frasada de boda is a wedding blanket. It's usually given as an endowment between a uh, bride or groom to the uh, groom's family to the bride or the bride's family to the groom. Um, in my family, uh, I we Lisa and I received our wedding blanket from my aunt who uh, gave it to us and I'll show you right now. <laughs> the, 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 that's the only characteristic. The only other characteristic of the wedding blanket is very simple, more utility. The one on the left is the wedding blanket that I received when we got married, or we received when we got married. And the one on the right is an example of a wedding blanket that Lisa wove. And it's, there's some symbology in the three stripes, and I don't know if I want to get into it, but um, anyway. <laughs> so the three stripes on one, one end represent the two parents and the one child to be married. The three stripes in the middle indicate the two children to be married or the two persons to be married. And the new the center stripe the center band is the uh, new family formed in by the marriage. Uh, the indigo and black rhythmic banding become very common as a trade item. There's um, I don't know how many hundreds or, or you know I don't know how many pieces were made. There's records of twenty thousand pieces going back to Mexico in 1840, um, and then twenty thousand going to California on the Spanish scale. Well. I don't know whether that's just the type of blanket that was produced in New Mexico or other types of woven goods that were deemed uh, blankets, rosado. Um, you can see these pieces have alternating black and blue. They're very common. Yes, there <laughs> and, are a lot I, of them with that color. color. And I took a word out of here, but I'm not gonna tell you that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the diamond blankets, there's, uh, a small percentage of the blankets uh, of the Rio Grande weavings uh, probably contained a Brazil wood or sapan or logwood. And most woods have tannic acid that produce browns uh, or tans like that. Uh, there's a lot of these pieces with, that have this brown uh, palette. Uh, what happened <clears throat> after the 1860s uh, was that the packet dye or the aniline dye was introduced into New Mexico. and what happens during that decade is that the Rambouillet or WA sheep were introduced and then the packet dye. So the, the weavings change from blue, black, and white to red, black, and white, or red, yellow, and black, or uh, and later on brighter colors. But uh, you can see these are still striped patterns. A lot of times they would be separated by white bands in such a way, you know, to separate the bands uh, or sections of the piece. And then there's a cotton blankets. There's very few of the cotton blankets that have been found. And um, it comes from the southern part of the they, Yeah, they come from a real Oahu, which is near Albuquerque and even south of Albuquerque, because it, it was uh, uh, easier to, to grow the cotton in a more in a warmer climate than here in north, northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the Malacatas appropriate spindle for cotton. It's you talk about that. Oh. oh, because it's supported. It's anyhow, yeah, it works. But I haven't ever done it, so I'm not sure why we did. <laughs> I've never spun cotton. <laughs> okay. Then the Saltillo Sarape with Mr. Gutierrez knows more about than I do. Um, we have just researched, you know, we've seen quite a few, but um, it's interesting to see these pieces and how it affects the Rio Grande weavings. Um, the formal design of these pieces that we've seen are the border around the outside of the piece and then the the diamond in the center this diamond is usually about a third of the piece so uh, it's a very big diamond in the middle and 
Yeah. And you can see the vertical element structure in the backgrounds in both of these. Uh, the saltillos were meant for the rich, and that's why they were that took so long, and they were uh, the weavers. Hopefully, were paid well to weave them because uh, they take. Well, we have experience in weaving a saltillo that Lisa will show you. It take for a year complete, and that includes the spinning and everything like that. And if you look at this piece, it's a good uh, piece. It actually comes from Mark Winter's uh, catalog. And one of the things in this piece, you can see the small chevrons, the white, little white design to the red dot in the middle, and then also the zigzag or the chevron design that is found in these. What happens is those designs start to show up in, in uh, in Rio Grande. Uh, there's an interesting thing about this left hand piece is the the warp is continuous on this piece. So it probably isn't even Spanish woven. It could be woven on, a, on an upright loom, but I'm looking at the structure of the of the design and it has the serrate diamond, uh, blue, black, and white made in two widths and then sewn together. And I should mention in order to make a, a blanket size weaving from two narrow widths, you have you can do tapestry in that construction. Whereas if you try to do the double weave where it's, it's woven in two layers, you can't do that because it's hard to see the bottom layer as you're weaving. Yeah, so you can see in Rio Grande Saltillos, you can look at the end of the piece, you can see there's stripes at the beginning, the stripes at the end. This is one of the characteristics of the Rio Grande as opposed to the Mexican Saltillo. And um, one of the things I look at is the corner of the piece. I look at multiple warp threads and I look at uh, the finish. Sometimes a lot of the old pieces, they don't have a fringe. Some pieces you can see a couple of knots and for blankets, they would cut off the fringe in order to use it as blankets so they wouldn't have fringe in the face like that. So a lot of pieces don't, you can't see the warp. Um, you can see these pieces early Rio Grande uh, with the element structures, the diamond in the middle, and you can see the, the elements put in the, within the stripes. And the piece on the right, you can see the actual small elements of saltillo elements, uh, the backgrounds up here, and then actually the diamonds in a small form within the banded structure. There's also a group of uh, later uh, saltillos that were woven later, later on that have the radiating structure where the design elements start in the center of the design and they radiate out to the side. Of the, of the piece. And I think I started you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, this is going to take it over. Well, I don't know if I can keep up the pace that you did, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, so, valleros are, I, I think of them as a variation on, on Saltillo, but it's the very first genuine, you know, New Mexico development. And basically, it, it is the addition of these eight pointed stars which look kind of like quilts, um, you know, the quilt stars, uh, but, um, and, and the source of them may be from quilts, it may be from, uh, uh, from Moorish influence, uh, so through Spain and Mexico and up here. Um, so that's an unknown where those come from. It starts to show up. It starts to show around 1865, around there. And that's after the Americans have come into the area, so I don't know. There's 1835. Or Anyhow, um, so these locations, the name comes from El Valle, which is a town up the road from us in the mountains. Um, Las Trampas is, is uh, the variation. What we were taught from Irvin's father is Las Trampas is this particular variation. There's a Trampas Vallero, which has the eight pointed stars in the corners. The eight pointed stars at the corners and then one in the center, which is a quincunx. Um, that it still maintains a vertical border uh, on this it's side. So that structure is maintained from the saltillo. And because it develops when those bright colors uh, become available to the weavers around here, uh, we see valleros are typically really bright. So um, so I, I use that, I think it's a fancy word, but it's a, a coin clunk. So Trumpas Bayero is the one with the stars in the corners and one in the center. We still have that vertical uh, design and the radiating design of the, uh, 
and, and the horizontal stripes. So radiating designs, all these things that come from the Saltillo style and into that. Um, so these are, Irvin had already spoken to you about the sources of these materials. So the Germantown and Zephyr yarns, um, the earliest valleros are woven from these uh, commercial yarns that are, uh, you know, come from back east and were traded here. And then later on, we get uh, the hand spun ones from this uh, Rambouillet, uh, whatever, slash merino, <laughs> the finer wool breed. Um, and so these ones will be um, coarser, they're thicker yarns. They tend to be, uh, again, also brightly colored, but, um, but colored with those package dyes. So Urban's already been telling you all about that. The Chimayo style, which is uh, what we're all about, um, is two stripes in the center designs. But this is sort of where things start. Uh, we have a standardized sizes. He already mentioned those two um, standardized yarns, uh, which at this point is the JNH Claspin's yarn um, colors. Typically in those earliest ones, it's red, black, and white. So we have lots of red background ones in this very beginning stages of the industry. Um, it's a cottage industry, meaning the weavers are working in their homes. They're contracted to a dealer um, who's, who's actually selling the pieces, but it means that um, these people don't have to, uh, the weavers don't have to be uh, invested in yarns, which is a difficult thing. Um, it comes about because of trains and tourists coming to the area. So 1880 is the completion of the first trains, uh, train lines through New Mexico um, or into New Mexico, I guess. Pan Southwest influences, I think, is a great term to describe that the weavers, they, they picked up on, uh, actually, I, I, it probably came from the dealers, but the dealers picked up on all kinds of Southwestern designs and ideas that they just kind of brought into Chimaya. So it kind of comes from all over the place, including that swastika, uh, which is a rolling log design. Um, and I think that the concept of uh, this design de density is really important. So we've just been looking at all those saltillos and balletos, and those are, uh, you know, have tapestry all the way. When we get into Chimaya, we're, we're stopping to throw the shuttle, to do shuttle work that goes all the way across. And that simplifies the whole process. Um, so these are uh, also very early ones, early Chimayos. You can see this evolution um, to the two stripes in the center design, but the stripes are, are and the shuttle work is taking over the, the spacing on the piece. So the, the design, density is becoming less and less. Um, and we get to these, which are uh, kind of more classic Chimayo. Another thing that emerges, um, so now we have the two stripes in the center design on these. These are both larger pieces. We also have secondary designs. And we have these things, which are called hospas, um, which are used to create designs without doing tapestry. So. Um, the challenge on these uh, in, in Chimayo, uh, from a weaver's point of view, is doing a good edge when you're going back and forth between doing tapestry work and shuttle work, which are very, very different. And you still have to have the same uh, yarn, weft yarn density, I guess, is the way to describe it. I need to mention that the, the form, this form of the two stripes in the center design, this was a result of the, one of the results of the Depression era and there were seven dealers here in Chimayo uh, with many, many men weavers working for them. And they got together and decided how much work to be put in the piece for what amount to pay the, the weavers. And so the weaver puts the same amount of tapestry and or shuttle work in the piece for a certain price. So that's why you see the sizes of the designs a certain size, and they're pretty common, such as these two pieces right here. But the individual designs by the weavers are different. That's called price fixing. Which is illegal. Illegal, yes. So these are some really big designs uh, from, I think, the, the you know, 
the strongest time, I think, of, of Chiamayao weaving, which is probably uh, before World War II. Um, these big, big designs came from that period. Uh, I don't know what else you wanted to say. There's a lot of different, I actually wrote a book and I, I added a lot of information that my thoughts about Chimaya design and, and um, basic formats of how you how you fill the space. You can see on this one on the right, the uh, these curly cues, that is a really, uh, a real Mexican influence, Mexican Indian influence. So uh, I think the Pan Southwest has the Rio Grande stripe plus the Saltillo influence of the diamond. And then these other square designs, which can be found in Navajo weaving as well. So, uh, step designs. Step designs, yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Curly cues are fun. Lots of, yeah, these are kind of curly cue kind of things. There's a lot going on. So, the, the, you want to start? Yeah, go. So, the coats. the coats and vests, they started to, Julius Gann's company in, in Santa Fe uh, was established and in 1922, supposedly, they started to cut up the large blanket size weavings into uh, smaller pieces, uh, into clothing patterns and sewing them up and selling them as Chimayo coats and uh, Chimayo jackets, Chimayo vests nowadays. Cordon. Okay. Then we got into Sentinel Traditional Arts. Um, it's our shop. We started in 1982. This is what our shop looks inside every once in a while. And <laughs> we, have, a we have lots of pillows at that time, but we don't have any now. <laughs> anyway, and then you can see the variety of pieces on the walls. Those are the places that Lisa and I hang our pieces. And we have other contract weavers that do the smaller pieces in, in the shop like that. So um, this, the shop, my father, Jake Trujillo, um, comes from the Ortega and the Trujillo families, which were are one of the main weaving families now uh, in Chimayo. And he taught me to weave in 1965. And this is a picture of him in the 1930s. He was a an instructor for the WPA program in El Rito Vocational School and also here in Espanola High School. The vocational program was trying to get people to spin, dye, and yarn, spin, dye, and weave uh, the old patterns to go back to hand spinning, natural dyes. And he was one of the, the main teachers up there who, who revived the arts in, uh, in the 1930s. Here he is later on. You can see he's, he wove mostly wide pieces, 30, 16 inch pieces. Uh, you can see his loom is like a box structure. It's, if you go to Oaxaca, a lot of the looms look the same as this. I mean, but I've, but I've seen San Miguel de Allende. It's been the, um, anyway. So this is, when he wove this, he told me this was a uh, classic Chimayo and it would have every technique in the, in the piece and every area that you could place a design uh, in. And he wove that when I was in grade school <laughs> and he gave it to me at that time. It's a big blanket size piece of four and a half by seven. And then it comes to me. And anyway, I, I've woven quite a few pieces with indigo. I do a lot of indigo dyeing and um, we use wool that's actually grown by my sister now. Uh, I have it uh, mill spun for me. Lisa hand spins a lot of her pieces. You'll see her pieces in a minute. And then um, these are, again, band and stripe in a, uh, common. <laughs> and then these are my interpretations of Chimayos. The one on the left is more classic with the candlestick designs coming out from the sides. And then um, the one on the right is more what I call a hybrid, which means it has like the Rio Grande influence and then it has the Saltillo influence. Uh, has the Chimayo influence all in one piece. It's kind of like uh, what I call a hybrid mixing the style. And one of the techniques that I've worked on in my life is uh, the weft ecot. Uh, it's called weft ecot within a tapestry, which is not that common. And ecot is basically wrapping a bunch of a bundle of threads with resist. And then um, if you dye or resist the the wool in a certain place when you weave. After you dye and weave the piece, it'll come out as a design. And it looks like this. This is what it looks like after the resists are placed on. The design I'm going to show you had 1,600 resists. In other words, I had to make wrap the bundle of threads in 1,600 places. Uh, this is the 
the wool that I had to dye to get into one light dye lot, which is about seven pounds of wool, which is a lot. And then you can see the undyed, when the resistor taken off, it's an undyed portion of the thread. And this is the design that those threads, those previous slides show in terms of the thread going back and forth and forming a design within the structure of the tapestry weave, which means that the weft thread going across the piece from side to side is broken up into several threads. One of those threads is the weft B cut thread, and it isn't common that I know. Of. This is the piece that I put five of the strings in, uh, and then I have some other E cut on the ends, and I won't go into that. But then these are some saltillos variations that I've woven. If, if you actually look at our pieces, they're all different. They aren't one design mass produced. My, our, my father taught us to weave a single design. And in doing that, we would learn uh, how, to, how to weave, basically. And so these are, uh, the, the one on the left is a scallop circle, not real scallop circle, but uh, somewhat of a round uh, emblem in the center. And some of the saltillos um, that, that I've woven have that. And then this one on the right is more contemporary with the circles in the middle. This one on the left is something that I wove out of a merino silk and it has real gold 14 karat gold uh, red in it uh, the one on the right is a bayero and it has eight pointed stars and you can see the intricacy of the background it's influenced from a lot of the saltillo that i've seen the one on the left is uh, again a hybrid chimayo rio grande bayero uh, all in one piece like that uh, this one piece won grand prize at the spanish market in 2000 19, 18, 18, I don't know, back in the back. Uh, and then the one on the right um, is a tapestry that I wove based on a jaguar. It's based on a, um, I forgot where it's based on. Tunisian? No, um, no, yeah, it's Tunisian, it's a, Algiers. It's a, it's a mural, it's a Roman mural in Algiers. And the, the leopard figure was one of the figures in this uh, thing. Uh, there's a Greek vase and just my own interpreted. You can see the bottom of this piece. I really didn't know what I was weaving. I was just weaving to fill up space. And then finally I got an idea and started the idea, <laughs> which is what happens when I'm weaving all these geometric. I really don't know what I'm doing. And I just start weaving and eventually I start thinking of ideas that I could do with the colors and stuff. These are small tapestries that I've developed um, for use as a hanging as opposed to any other use. and. Um, they're more contemporary. Uh, they do have cartoons. So I make cartoons for these designs and then I draw the cartoon on the warp and uh, I'll choose the colors when I'm weaving so I can change colors at any time. But um, let's see that. These are all that different styles of that. Um, I was doing curve studies at one time, doing things like that. Um, these are magic markers <laughs> or markers in the sketches from them. Anyway, so I have the old band and stripe with the, the Moki kind of intermixed with, with the design. These are the curve studies, that some of the curve studies they did. And um, they're just fun to do, but they're abstract saltillo like that. And then this is a, a piece that I will just without the square, but a different shape than the square rectangle, but a step design. Is it OK to keep going? We're, we're running out of time. Just do it quick. Okay. No, go ahead. I think people would like to see your work. Okay. Um, these these are all pretty old ones, I think, that, that we have in here. Uh, the one on the left um, was very old. I think that was only 36 inches wide. So that was probably um, 1982, between 82 and 84. Um, I So I right away took to doing tiny little elements for some for my reason. Anyhow, uh, but it's fun to, to fill space with those little elements. Um, this one on the right, um, I thought those looked like uh, birds, like like birds uh, migrating. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it's just fun to fill up space in different ways, but that's uh, lots of little tiny elements in the space. Uh, the one on the, on the left, that was called carnelian. Um, that actually was right after we invaded Afghanistan, uh, way back when. Um, and I 
wanted to work from an element that I I found in um, in Afghani blankets for some reason, or, or I think it was textiles and you know, rugs probably. And I just liked that element. It reminded me of the Vieta stars. It was different though, but it was the same kinds of angles. So I worked, I combined those elements with the, the more traditional Vieta. Um, and this was also using lots of leftover yarns, which is kind of my role in the shop. <laughs> I've always done is using the leftovers from other weavers. So that's what's going on in both of these. This was an order, the one on the right. Um, it was a custom order for a family thing. Uh, the one on the left here is a Vieta that I did for, uh, I, I, I called it um, Tell and Tales. It wound up in a church in Kansas City. <laughs> and that one's all hand spun and, and cochineal and indigo basically, and then undyed colors too. Oh, I think there's some, uh, I don't remember what the orange was, probably matter is that. Uh, the one on the right here is also all uh, natural dyes, I think, except the screamy green, which I, I do that sometimes. Anyhow, uh, okay. and yeah, purple is probably commercial too. Anyhow, I mix things up sometimes. So these Valletos, uh this was grape and lime, that was its name. <laughs> um, this one I think is, this one is very Valletto. This is the one that, that we still have here. So, uh, and this one, is uh, mostly um, synthetic dyes. This is stuff, the, the acid dye stuff that Irvin dyed. And I want to give him credit for giving me such a great palette to work in. But more Valletos. I don't know why these are all Valletos. Uh, so the one, the one on the right here is the slides you could find while I wasn't here to help put this together. This is, remember Irvin was talking about a, a hybrid piece. I tried to make this piece elements or, or show influence from each of the four main traditional things. So it's got Rio Grande stripes, which is, you know, is dominated by stripes. It has a Vieta stars, one in each corner. This center design is very uh, Chimayo, very Chimayo. Uh, but I also wanted to bring in the Saltillo influence by trying to come up with sort of a makeshift border that goes in. Um, and of course, the hospice are sort of filling in, and uh, but hospice are definitely a very, uh, a very Chimayo element. Um, these little manitas are something that are very common in um, in Rio Grande designs. So, and this one is all hand spun, and indigo is the only dye. The others are undyed. These are more Chimayos. I had tried. Uh, an, an early goal of mine that took me many, many years to achieve was to try and make, take a Chimayo design, the basics of the Chimayo design and make it fill the space. And, and that's what I did here on this one. Um, the one on the right is, is uh, what we call a prototypical Chimayo. Um, and so it has these elements, Irvin called the candlesticks. This is a little bit different because it's got an awfully long, it's got a long wick. <laughs> but um, so it's, and I think that I think of these as that transition between the, the stripes, um, the stripes of the, the Rio Grande influence, the center diamond from the uh, Saltillo influence and the, the borders of the Saltillo influence, but making it so much easier to weave. Um, and these are a, a very different way of thinking when you're doing them, um, and they're a lot of fun to do. Uh, I don't remember the name of the one on the left at this one. This one was Churro yarn, Al Churro, but not my spinning. Um, and it was all natural dyes also. I remember that one. That's from a long time ago. <laughs> uh, Chimayo on the, on the right side here um yeah see he hasn't he, these are all old pieces <laughs> uh so this one is is taking the the elements of saltillo and putting them behind the stripes so this has got some continuity uh that that you would do in a, in a saltillo and the logic of it continues but it continues behind the stripes and that is something that I 
I don't know. I enjoyed working on. Uh, I did a handful of pieces like that. There's another another Chimayo. Can't remember what these are called. <laughs> uh, these are more um, hand spun pieces. So um, I have always found the challenge of working with hand spun is to show off the natural variations that happen in the wool because I tend to spin um, in the grease more than anything else. Um, rather than card the wool and get a nice even color, I'd rather have the, um, the natural variations in the fleece show up. And I want to show it off <clears throat> to the best of my abilities and, and you know, make it just enrich it instead of uh, make it confusing, which is the other possibility. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, the one on the right was, was uh, it had to do with ski tips. And, uh, skiing and, and mountains, mountain tops and skiing. You know, that, you made me laugh. I forget what it's called though. Um, anyhow, more hand spun. <clears throat> the one on the left, this one is also all hand spun natural dyes um, and uh, a lot of really, I, I think, rich colors. So I depend on Irvin to give me uh, this great palette because he's the one who does all the dyeing. Um, but you know, I get to choose my colors, but he does the dyeing. The one on the right side uses a lot of what we call piquetos. So they're little dots. Um, and uh, the word actually has something to do with like bites, like mosquito bites. Piquetos. So they're little, they're little piquetos. raised piquetos, yes, little raised things. So this thing is both, it's a combination of tapestry and a zillion piquetos and these ecot little diamonds in here. So um, many, many years ago, Irvin described how he was going to put ecot in tapestry. And then he explained what he was going to do, but he was going to do these really large pieces. Like, and I, I, this is what I did. <laughs> so I went, oh, well, that ecot thing in the context of tapestry sounds interesting, but I didn't, didn't take on the large scale. I did it on a smaller scale. Um, this is called hyperactive. I remember that one. This piece is uh, devotion. <clears throat> it has a heart in the middle of it. It has some faces in that heart that I didn't intend to weave, but they're there. Um, this is all hand spun <clears throat> wool. It is set at 12 inch per inch instead of eight. So pretty much everything that we weave, we weave at eight inch per inch. This was done at 12, mm -hmm. which uh, in a linen warp. Um, set at 12. I won't Two talk about that. Two pieces seamed, and it. Uh, this is the the piece that I have spent the longest amount of time on. So this was nine months on the loom, nine months of weaving, um, and that doesn't include however many. It's probably basically a, at least that much um, in spinning time. So when you spin that thin, it takes forever. Um, this is all tapestry. This isn't like those piquetos. This is this is about 60 by 90 inches. And the second uh, saltillo that I did that was fine like that also set at 12 inch per inch, all hand spun. That's all cochineal and indigo and undyed wool. Um, this one is called Passion in the Web, which is uh, among other things a kind of a pun uh, on weaving because that's webs. <laughs> Anyhow, weavers weave webs. Um, and this one, if you take a look at the lines, they all connect up. So lines in the background will connect up and get wrapped up in, in the border design or get wrapped up into the center design. So they, the lines kind of continue in and, and it goes on into the center which is not visible. So I, I mean, it doesn't, it goes to a, to a nothingness, I guess, <laughs> but to, a to a point, but there, anyhow, if, if you zoomed in, which you can't do here. Two pieces. Uh, yeah, this is also two pieces seamed. It also has a whole bunch of macrame on the fringe, which was fun to do. I tried to make the fringe actually uh, repeat the border. Um, so I kind of assume. No, that was also 60 by 90 inches. These are, again, as the talk about using up leftovers of other people's stuff. So these are um, mostly natural dyes, but not all. Um, and, and 
just using them. This is really simple. It's actually tapestry, but it's only two colors at one time, um, except for with a little Taco Bell bill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think of it that way. I didn't mean to it's make it that way, bell. but it's a cityscape. And these are the, the step designs. So. Um, the one on the left here is a piece that I wove when my children were very, very small and I had no continuity in my weaving. Thus, uh, he put it in upside down, but it starts over here where, I'm, where my initials are. And I never knew when I finally got back on the loom, I never knew where I was going. So I'd have to sort of start all over again. And eventually it just goes off into outer space. <laughs> so I right, added yeah, upside down. This one, uh, this piece is actually one of the almost, it might be the only real uh, collaboration piece between Irvin and I. So we were demonstrating at a fair and he would weave for a while and then I would weave for a while. And it has the same problem of, in that it's very hard to have any continuity between the two of us. Um, and eventually it went off into this, this Joker hat thing. Harlequin. <laughs> the Harlequin, Harlequin hat. Harlequin. <laughs> we found Jokers. We were, we were also doing, we were doing an order for the Raffle Rand Company and we were, the name of the piece is the man who sold his soul to fashion so you can tell how we feel about this one. uh the one on the left here is is called four season tree i've woven a lot of trees i really enjoy them i, I i've probably done one every maybe five years or something i i weave a tree for the fun of it um this picks up on on some symbolism including some borrowed uh Pueblo kind of symbolism of the, the rain clouds, but and and lightning strikes. Um, the one reason I love, love, love trees is because I I've been told that the roots go down as far down into the ground as as the tree lifts up into the air. And I think that's really important. I think that's we how we stay connected. We, we go down into the earth and we can reach up into the air up into the sky. The one on the right, I think um, anybody who sees me on Facebook knows that face. <laughs> but this is the whole the whole piece. Um, and it goes up. So it came from this sort of chaotic thing where the face is, and it goes into an orderly, much more Saltillo influenced design up on top. Um, this it also had to do with uh, the face I uh, my Anyhow, had to do with uh, junior high art instruction that our kids were going through. And I thought, well, I'm going to try and figure out how to do a face just with angles. And, and I did that. So it wound up being my face because I really want to have, this is the hair I want, is this big fluffy hair. <laughs> At least I did then. Anyhow, and glasses. So uh, that's fun. Um, this one was influenced actually by by some orders that we were doing, uh, but but I I completely moved beyond and uh, above and beyond what those orders were. But this is also using leftover yarns, all kinds of different uh, colors, mostly um, synthetic yarns and dyes. The one on the right here is called Some of the Parts. That piece um, finally sold actually very recently, just a, a month or so ago. Um, that piece comes from uh, definitely inspired by color. It, it was a design that I actually repeated. So this is very, very close to a design I did in 1987, came back and did it again in 2013, um, where I all of a sudden had access to some really crazy bright colors. Um, a lot of these were uh, yarns dyed um, by uh, a friend, anyhow, where I had, she had let me um, she had sold me her stash, basically. <laughs> so, and so it was a lot of hand dyed yarns um, that she had dyed, plus natural dyed yarns that we had dyed. There's some commercial yarns, there's knitting yarn in here, um, but it just has more energy. And, and uh, I, I think of it as a very positive piece. So, that was amazing. Those pieces are incredible. So we have a couple questions regarding the swastika. Uh, I can't even say the word the swastika blanket. Um, one, somebody didn't understand the relevance of that to the topic. 
Um, and I guess it was the placement, but you can talk about that. And then somebody else mentioned that that whirlwind design, you often see in California basketry as well. Um, it shows up, it's very, very common. There are a lot of pieces pre-World War II that have the, that whirling log or-, or the, the whirling log is, is the, looks like a swastika only it's clockwise as opposed to kind of, the Nazi swastika is counterclockwise. And the uh, native uh, whirling log is turns to the right. It's clockwise, yeah. It's, I, we, it's basically been abandoned. I mean, you know, we, we try very hard to not ever, ever have to leave them. I, to, my, to my way of thinking, it's been totally destroyed. <laughs> and I, I don't feel comfortable with it. So I don't, do, I don't want to do them anymore. But there are a lot of them before World War II. There are a lot of them in Chimayo pieces. Um, somebody wanted to know: Do um, do you copyright your designs? Uh, it really, for posterity, it probably wouldn't do our heirs any good. It it costs five hundred. I forgot how what the registration is it's like per, per piece. It's like yeah, I have no idea. But it's not worth it because now with the internet, whoever saw this slideshow can take the designs and go with it and they can keep you know there's no way to protect it it's like it but my my philosophy is that if they want to copy it good luck we have had people copy them but uh the other i'd also mention that we've had um we have a clothing company that's licensing some of our designs so they they actually paid us to use them and i think that line will come out in the spring so. And who, who, who's doing that line so we can keep our eye out? It's Ariat. Ariat. Ariat? Yeah, Ariat. I don't know Ariat. how you spell it. But yeah. It's a Western wear. Yeah, okay. They're really um, beautiful designs. For what we've seen, the, the clothing that they're making out of them is just beautiful. <laughs> Love what they're doing. So one person is asking if you put a spirit line in your work. Yes, the spirit line is each line of wool that goes back and forth. <laughs> that is the spirit. It continues and it continues until it ends, but it ends and it leaves. So the spirit is there. And I think a person who's experienced the pieces live will know that the spirit is there. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's a, It isn't the same thing. <laughs> it's not the same as a native, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah so it kind of goes with you know the spirits there and um our next question is how much time does it take to weave such rugs and i knew um lisa you had mentioned nine months just for the weaving but then also the spinning of the wool the dyeing of the colors or the purchasing of it um and how many years of experience does it take to become a weaver of the quality that you all are urban started in 1965 I started in 1982, and, and we've she's been way ahead of me. So. <laughs> I I don't know about that, but uh, we've, I mean, you know, we've been weaving professionally all that time, and we're always learning new stuff. I tell people, I tell people I was a professional weaver before I started weaving because I knew that was what I was going to do. I I graduated college, we got married the next week, and then and then started the business like immediately. So I, it was because I, there was no way I was going to be able to get a job at that point. I, I didn't have, for all kinds of reasons, my, my work experience was mostly McDonald's. So when I graduated college, so I wasn't going to get a job in 1982. And, and so we started the business and, and, you know, we're just hoping for the best. But I, I committed to being a professional weaver before I ever actually knew whether I could weave or not. So. And I think it takes... Each person is different. Yeah. Uh, we've worked with a lot of students, and some people pick it up right away, and some people have a have a harder time. So it just depends on the person. And I had a good teacher, and good he gave me a good philosophy when I was very young. And we've done a lot of work researching, uh, looking at a lot of pieces recently. How, how many weavers do you employ at your business? We've had up to 30 weavers right now. We only have four. And so we're representing more people on consignment than, than yeah. contracting at this point. Yeah, so right now we have more pieces from northern New Mexico as opposed to traditional 
pieces and I don't know if that's bad or good. You'll see where it takes you, <laughs> right? I don't really want to. I want to go back to the garage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, another one is where uh, were the small tapestries uh, created on a horizontal loom? Okay. Yeah, it's all it's all horizontal. So we have narrower looms for narrower pieces. So. Um, down to, I mean, we don't we don't have any looms warped at five inches, but but the people who weave coasters do it on a five inch warp. Um, but Urban and I are weaving mostly at forty eight inches. So, so yeah, you just you you make up you build a narrower loom for a narrower warp. Yeah, and the, the pieces are a blanket weight. They're a little bit finer than a rug, um, and I think the difference between say uh, the pieces from Oaxaca that I've seen is the warp threads on the selvage or you know, multiple warp threads on a Mexican piece. And for us, it's either two or three threads on each end of the piece. So it's not as strong. Yeah. Not as bulky at the edge, I guess. And one person was asking about the piece you said is in a church in Kansas City, and they were wondering what church, if you knew, so they could visit it. It's a Catholic church, and it's new construction. and and I don't remember the name of it, but it was close to the, uh, not very far away from where the art museum is there, uh, the, the modern art museum. And there's, a, there's a, a, a pedestrian mall kind of thing that was really close to it. And, and I, I, it's a new, it's a, it a, a new, it was a new church. So it's, I don't know, 10 years old or something now. And it, um, or maybe 15. And the, the main uh, sanctuary is, is quite modern, but the side sanctuary, the one for not Sunday mass, but daily mass um, was designed and uh, whatever, the furniture and stuff was all done by a, a, a great New Mexican Santero, um, Ramon, Ramon Jose Lopez. Lives in Santa Fe. So we have one final audience question, and then I have one small one. So this is, do you generally design your pieces in advance, or is it an organic process where you start with the basic idea, then let the artistry take over? We do both. <laughs> so we do both. All right. So some pieces, Urban does a lot of design work and really thinks through a, a, a lot more. Um, but even those, you have to you have to let it be an organic process. Um, if you're doing something, or when I do something like a, um, like a saltillo or a vallero or a chimayo, something traditional, I will usually try to come up with an overarching idea that I want to inform me and to inform the design. And I, and I let it, I really want the piece to tell me what it needs to be and what will make it better. So I think we both, we do both. Well, we have lots of um, thank yous and kudos in the chat, and we'll be sending that to you afterwards. I'll be sharing that as, a lot, as well as the Q&A questions with you. I'm just curious, Lisa, did you grow up in Chimayo? Um, no, I, boy, see, that's a tough one. I, I always like to say, I don't know when I grew up, I can't tell you, but I, I came from Southern California. We moved to um, New Mexico. We moved to Los Alamos when I was 13. Uh, went to college at UNM, which is where I met Irvin, and uh, committed to moving back up here. We moved back up here in '84. So, um, how many children do you have, and are they weavers as well? Two of them, uh, and one is a computer guy that does computer security. The other one is a weaver, and she she almost offered to stay and hang out for this, but she's she has been working here a couple days a week for the last few years, um, and she is committed to being she a weaver weaves, at this She point. weaves in Albuquerque. She lives in Albuquerque, and she weaves the rest of the time that she's not here. And she helps us like with the social media, things like that. And, uh, well, thank you so very much. And we love the conversation. As I said, we'll share all the comments in the chat with you. I'll be emailing it to you. Um, 
And I just want to, I want to invite you to the Arizona State Museum when you get a chance to get, if you will get cold this winter, come down south. We'd love to have you. And again, thank you so much, Lisa and Irvin. It's been a delight seeing your work and hearing about your traditions and your evolution as weavers. So thank you. Thank you.